and we are live. Good evening, everybody. My name is Claire. I'm the event coordinator for Village Books in Bellingham and Linden, Washington. We are so delighted that you could make it here this evening. Um, while people trickle into the room, um, I'm going to make a couple of announcements. If any of you are hearing an echo, there are a couple things you can try to do to get rid of that. You can put on some headphones. You can make sure that you only have one window open in your browser. And you can turn down the volume of your computer. So that's if you're hearing a little nasty echo that sometimes pops up. Um, to those of you, ha happily, most of our events are free events in our virtual Lit Live series. Um, however, we do give folks the option to contribute to our event programming at registration. And I want to say thank you to any of you who did kick in a few dollars um, for this event tonight. We really do appreciate it. Um, in these bizarre times in which we find ourselves, right? Um, Every little bit helps uh, to keep this programming going. So thank you very much. If you didn't, no sweat. We're just glad that we can still provide free programming. So thank you for coming. Um, I want to let you know about an event that's coming up on Saturday. That's this Saturday, the 12th at 4 p.m. We're going to have a group reading on Zoom for this brand new book, The Writer's Corner Anthology 2020. This is a compilation of prose and poetry that uh, people submitted, people who are members of our writing groups, which are still meeting virtually, sort of semi-privately right now. Um, but we have a biennial um, book that we publish every year. And so that's going to be Saturday the 12th at 4 p.m. So if you go to villagebooks.com, you can find the link and the registration information for that. Um, so we're inviting audience participation this evening. And so on Crowdcast, the way that looks, since it's not like Zoom where we can where we can see you, um, the way that you can um, engage with our speakers this evening is you can use that chat on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, if you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to put them into the chat. If you want to ask a question, what we do ask is that you please type it in all caps. If you type it in all caps, it's easy for us to find when we're kind of scrolling down through the chat to try to, try to find those questions. So um, please just put them in in all caps. I do want to state that the virtual readings gallery is a safe space. Any user exhibiting offensive, hateful, or inappropriate behavior will be dismissed from the event immediately. So, and now a little bit about our moderator this evening. Chef Christy Fox is co-owner an executive chef of Evolve Chocolate Plus Cafe, which is deliciously perched on the mezzanine level of Village Books and Paper Dreams in Fairhaven. Um, she is also the co-owner of um, Evolve Espresso Plus Provisions, which newly opened in downtown Bellingham in the, uh, in the Hotel Leo. So um, congratulations on that to her and, and her partner, Shannon, her wife, part, her wife, wife slash partner, Shannon, um, as they embark on two locations <laughs> in Bellingham. Uh, Chef Christy is a true artist who puts her very heart and soul in, into her food and it shows with every single dish. Um, and now our featured author, Gigi Berardi is a professor at Western Washington University and a freelance writer. She maintains the popular food blog, Food Wise and Food Resilience Vlog, and she's written numerous articles for general and scientific alike, scientific audiences alike. She's here this evening to present her book, her award-winning book, which I will let her tell you about, Food Wise, A Whole Systems Guide to Sustainable and Delicious Food Choices. So please join me in the you're from your home or wherever you happen to be. Join me in welcoming Christy Fox and Gigi Berardi. Oh, thank you, Claire. We tossed a coin and I'm <laughs> going to go first. But Christy is running the show tonight and I am so grateful for that. But I just wanted to thank Chef Christy Fox, who can be found usually in a kitchen. And, <laughs> um, and also a big thank you to Claire, the events coordinator extraordinaire of Village Books, our go-to independent bookstore. And I just wanted to give a shout out uh, for to indie bookstores and indie cafes and uh, <laughs> as Evolve is and uh, indie publishers. And my publisher, North Atlantic Books, is an independent publisher. Uh, Penguin Random House, one of the five giants, and um, I guess soon to be one of the four giants, um, is the distributor. But um, 
but anyway, and uh, and uh, just wanted to thank Village Books again for sponsoring and mentoring and hosting and supporting so many writers, including our very own Wacom writers and publishers. So, um, so, so anyway, I asked Christy if I could say just a few things about stories. So I know some of you have heard me talk. Some of you have heard me talk a lot. And, um, and, and thank you for reading my work. And um, the work I do is story writing and storytelling. And um, in the book, I say I like to gain food experiences through stories, through the stories of my friends. Why is this a favorite food? What brought them to this particular recipe? So um, as I look at uh, Chef Christy Fox and Shannon Fox's work and menu, for example, I see pints of soup and chopped salad and 85% chocolate, my favorite, uh, gluten-free, <laughs> vegan uh, cake, and uh, hummus that uh, goes under the name Greek layer dip. So there's stories there. And baked tomato in tahini sauce stuffed with organic brown rice with pine nuts and rose water and golden raisins. So, um, so I think uh, these two chefs for those stories, but for all of us, a bit of a story or a little humor, and this is a quote from the book and music go a long way. And so I looked for the word story, like how many times does the word story or stories appear in food wise? this book about making wise food choices. And so I saw in the uh, endorsements, I saw even hungrier for the full story about the staples of life. So Chuck Geisler at Cornell said that. And then um, another colleague talked about through the deeply personal principles, stories and recipes she shares with us in every page of this life affirming book. And that was Michael Appleby, Sir Michael Appleby, who is a, a professor in Edinburgh and he is uh, in the International Center for Animal Welfare Education. Now I had a lot of stories in here uh, in the beginning of the book, and a lot uh, of them were about food poisoning. And um, and I love these stories because I survived. But my daughter said, you can't just tell people these terrible stories. You can't. They, you have to have like some positive stories in here about your food. And so I, and so I was made sure after all the stories about the Sandinistas and Nicaragua and whatever and hiring the elephant when I had uh, amoebic disin dysentery. Uh, anyway, I did I did see, fortunately, all these stories ended on a happy note. I fully recovered. So I fully recovered. So that was for, uh, for my daughter. But really, uh, stories that don't quite go the way we want to, just like recipes, <laughs> as Chef Christy knows, become adventures and lovely products in themselves. And besides our local chefs, of course, M.F.K. Fisher, who wrote so many books on making do with very little. Uh, and Tamara Adler, the author of An Everlasting Meal, specialized in how to turn your disasters into something beautiful. So in the book, I also talk about the origin story of cheese. And I talk about other people's stories, too, uh, as told by people like Liz Carlisle talking about lentils in Montana, revitalizing a local food economy. And um, the conclusion of my book, and I'll, st I'll stop here, is I write, I explain some of my own values and where they come from in the stories woven through the book. I like tomatoes. I like milking sheep. I like most any farms that are smaller than mega sized. You don't have to. But those values of mine help explain my views of other things I talk about in this book 
And if you empathize with me, you'll understand what I'm getting at. And it may push you along on your own journey. So anyway, thank you, Chef Christy, for letting me say a few words about stories. And yes, of course. Life is about stories. It's important that we have them. And, you know, we, we derive our food from stories. I At least most of us, I believe we do. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking me to join you. I loved your book. I loved it. Uh, it's something that I embody every day in my life, uh, in the choices, not always the best choices. I'm human as, as we all are. Uh, but the principles that are behind the book are that of um, what I've done in my career for 30 years and that um, evolving learning lesson of choosing the right thing and, and asking the deeper questions of why, where does it come from? And how does that make me feel? And what is the grander, you know, the grander goal? But I'm, I'm happy to be here. Nice. Yes. yes. So there's a button. If you guys see purchase food wise here, you can you can click that button and purchase Gigi's book. If you haven't read it, I would highly suggest that you do. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So one of my favorite stories about you is uh, is your cheese making story. And when I first, one of the first things that I met you, uh, you had come in with a sister after uh, you were coming in to, to see us. And you, if you remember, that was a little bit, maybe a year or so ago. Uh, and you came in to introduce yourselves and to talk about what you did at the Abbey. Maybe if you could kind of share a little bit more about that story again about, because that was a very profound moment for me. And I say that because in my career of 30 years, one of the things that I've always said is that you have to be attached to something that you do. You have to be, it's food, right? It's life and, uh, and it's a life force. And your coming and talking about cheese really affected me that day and continues to. And so um, I think it's a, a story that, um, that you should share, if you will. Oh, the story of cheese is so... Cheese. So How amazing. Cheese. Yeah. So one of the things I say, I know that I know that uh, many of my students have a, a, a diversity of food preferences. And I really wrote the book to kind of honor and address the different food preferences that are out there and how we can possibly make choices. Um, with all the information and and anyway, cheese though is um, special. Most people who make cheese wax super eloquently about it and they get a little emotional about it because the transformation of milk uh, into <laughs> solid curds is um, miraculous. It's, it, it, it's, it's hard to think of uh, a better adjective. And can I just say that this summer I had the experience of teaching the cheese course. I teach the art and science of cheese with a good friend who's a, uh, a toxicologist. And, and the enrollment was bursting. It was a huge enrollment in COVID it's times. It's <laughs> and, and the challenge was how do you make cheese when you don't have all the equipment? Like when you completely strip it down and can you only make soft cheeses, cheeses, which are kind of simple, uh, relatively speaking, acid coagulated cheeses. Um, in the book, in the book, I talk about the, the origin story of cheese and how and how uh, undoubtedly uh, some traveler, no doubt a woman, was, uh, you know, had some milk, some liquid milk in a, a, a bag made of leather that had some lining in it from, uh, from, from the ruminant. And the enzymes in that at the end of the journey had curdled the milk into, into, uh, into a solid. And what happens is, if it, it is as simple as that, the transformation of milk into cheese. And, uh, and, and what happens is that the magic is in the aging, is actually in the aging. It's not a question of how long something ages. So old is not necessarily gold. I learned that. I was very lucky to be able to study affinage 
in France with the mm. Mons family, with the Mons lucky, family. Lucky, lucky woman you were. I did. I took it. I <laughs> took the course in French, which meant that I understood approximately 3% of what happened, but I could see, and I definitely had to, uh, had to observe uh, keenly. And, uh, and there, they could, there was one person in particular, his name was Roman, and he could tell as the cheeses were coming in that it had only been aged for a couple of days from the different dairies, the different creameries, he could tell exactly what that aging process was, would look like and what the product would what the cheese would become and whether or not he could accept it or not because he mm -hmm. so anyway their cheese begs lots and lots of innovation and observation cheese is in a, in effect a great revealer of attention deficit <laughs> because this is why i i feel that it should be a required course an entry course for all this 18,000 students at Western, because for one thing, it focuses us because once the temperature, once the temperature rises past, past the 86 degrees or 92 degrees for thermophilic back bacteria, yeah, yeah uh, bacteria, then it takes hours to get it to get it down. If you wait, if you're like a uh, Texton or, um, or uh, I'm making a Facebook post and not paying attention <laughs> and I don't heat the whey that I've drained from the curds to 195 degrees immediately, I will lose the, I will lose the acid and I will lose two pounds of ricotta. I will get nothing. And so sometimes the students have just like little smears of cheese to show because the acidity was too low. And um, anyway, so so in terms of, uh, of, of lifelong lessons and themes, cheese is quite incredible. And of course, I'm very lucky because I make cheese from the sheep that ah. I own. And I mean, my cheese is sheep cheese. And I see some people here from uh, Weston A. Price Foundation, and uh, the director there has her own, actually, dairy farm. And I'm very, very, very fortunate. But the students have my have great success when they use uh, a non-homogenized. Uh, so once again, it comes down to the W and Ys, whole food, and right. being informed, and the sustainable grazing practices. They go to Twin Brook. They um, they get Larry's milk, and they usually have no problems, even though it's not raw milk. My cheeses are raw milk, and so the cheese nun, the cheese nun was interested in cheese making in terms of the microbiology, the diversity of the biome in the caves at Regina Laudis in Connecticut. But then she had a full she had a Fulbright scholarship. She had a Fulbright scholarship and she went to France for three years to study the microbiology, the, the diversity uh, of the caves there. Now, she joined the Abbey at a time in the 60s of great, quote unquote, social ferment where many young women wanted to be in a community of women and want... An, progressive women, basically. And this is how she and her colleagues ended up at this abbey in the 1960s. Her brother took a different route, uh, Jocko Marcellini, and uh, he was, oh my gosh, he was at Woodstock. He was in a mm. Shanana. He was in Shanana. A very interesting <laughs> family. Everyone, wow. you know, he was a rock, he was a rocker, and she was a cloistered nun, contemplative nun. <laughs> anyway, and uh, and then she became a cause celeb because of the research she was doing on wood and the importance of wood. So whole, once again, yeah. whole systems. You can't go wrong using that as a touchstone. Amazing, what tutelage that you've had and, and uh, the, the lessons of as getting older doesn't mean that you're getting old. It means that you're, uh, you're getting better. You're ripening, right? As in cheese, we're, we're ripening yeah. as we get older, we better. Yeah. Uh -huh. crusty, Whoops. But, uh, getting better. Having a moment here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell me about 
being a foodie from a chef's perspective, I crack up when I hear those words because I use it too. To me, the the basis of, of what you of what you write about food wise, right? Whole foods. Um, it is the natural way it's always been. I mean, you, you're you're purchasing food, or you're 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 going to your local farmer, you're going to your local dairyman, you're going to your local rancher, and you're creating an, an intentional food. When did foodie become that thing? Why why is what we have always done now become foodie? And the basic principles of life. It's food wise. This book. It's the basic principles of life. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you mean that's beautifully said? Do you mean for me, or do you think like yeah, for for, you. Uh, for me for, for you. me? Yeah, for you. Well, for me, I, I was I never knew anything other than foodie uh, mm -hmm. ism uh, because I grew up in a traditional Italian family, and mm -hmm. I see my sister on here, and she's like, yeah, Hi, and. Sister. Yeah, hi sister. And um and uh food was everything. And so my father was involved and my mother was involved and my mother learned everything she uh she she did from uh from her mother-in-law, my father's mother, and uh and um it, it was an act of love. It was an mm -hmm. act of love and it was an act of, it was an act of caring. And, uh, and my challenge was with my busy life, how do I carry that, uh, carry that forward? And right now at this moment, I have to say I'm lucky. So I, perhaps you can relate, uh, Christy, Definitely. to have a life partner who shares that love also. Of uh, of food, of food preparation. I mean, it's a little bit different for you. For you, you are you are serving. You are serving food. This is like truly your profession as well as and avocation as well as uh, as your you know the theme of your life on a personal level. I mean, for me, I guess it would be the cheese, which I don't really sell. Which I don't sell. Let me make it clear. But I, I you know, I give. I if give. you did, I'd be like, be me, me, cheese for me. Yeah. Um, I owe you too. Uh, I know that. Teach me. Um, teach me. Yeah. Just, just, just teach me. I, I'm good with that. <laughs> okay. Um, that's <laughs> serotonin rush. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm so lucky that we share the this this <laughs> Lisa. Me too, Lisa Daly. Yeah. Shout out, Sidekick <laughs> Press. Thank you. And in fact, look at this right here. I get to put a little announcement in, uh, maybe, uh, if that Crowdcast says, I already sent that message. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So, uh, so that's exciting. So, anyway, there's a little note about uh, my website that Lisa has resuscitated here and developed. Uh, Lisa mm. Daly Sidekick Press. Thank you so much. Uh, and I also see Holly and Dan on here, my partners in crime on Instagram. So uh, all of these people, by the way, who I've just sh called out, are are big foodies. And uh, and 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 yeah, you're on the list. You're on the list for for cheese. Um, I you know I maybe one question is like how did college college happened and like really you're a foodie in college well now every now people are yes that was not a thing when i was in college people weren't foodies and i went to uc san diego and mostly we were just like you know i found a bathroom <laughs> we lost gigi for the moment <laughs> she'll come back with her story about how she gained being a foodie in college she'll she'll be back this is where you and i are supposed to do like our little soft yeah. share routine <laughs> <laughs> this is where you're supposed to start dancing christy oh yes oh yes that's or singing that's so something. oh she's yeah singing. she actually sure. will be back folks she will um sometimes <laughs> this happens it's the magic of the of the internet um Welcome to our life in 2020, right? I mean, it's as unpredictable yes. as everything. So we just, you just wait for it. Just wait for it. 
Just right. For it. Well, hey, this gives me the opportunity to say that thing that I forgot to say at the very beginning that in my that intro, thing. I actually had in red and bold faced and still managed to skip over it, which is that center screen, there's a green button that says purchase food wise here. So if everybody clicks on that and go, it will take you straight to the Village Books website where you can find food wise, you can purchase it from Village Books. We happen to have signed copies. Gigi was kind enough to provide us with these beautiful signed book plates that have little messages in each one so our copies are signed she's back and also Yay! there's there's a link to evolve's website because i'll tell you what if you are looking for the best gift for someone for the holidays if you were to give them a copy of food wise and a gift card to evolve you would be the favorite of all of the it's gift givers in the family love. so okay <laughs> well Welcome back, hi. Gigi. Hi, hi. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> look, I was just going to say that at that point, my interest in food and like people's lack of food <laughs> um, joined. And uh, and uh, Francis Morlape had just written Diet for a Small Planet. And I was captivated by that book. And at that point, I became a vegetarian for seven years until I had a Fulbright in Italy to study food. And uh, was living with farmers and had to partake uh, of yeah. what they were of what they were offering me. But anyway, uh, so issues of food security, but on a world level, uh, became up front and center. And um, and I edited a book that Francis Morlape did the forward to called World Food Population Development. So it kind of rekindled uh, that interest in that interest in food. I, I love. I I love what food brings us together in all the different worlds. Like we were speaking about earlier that, you know, we come from very different backgrounds, obviously. Um, I started off in, I right out of high school, went to culinary school um, in search of a place of belonging and, and what was that? And uh, the culinary world every day, every year, every month, um, spanning 30 years, a new door opened, a new way to look through it and to identify myself and to identify with society or with in past traditions or in future traditions. And it's the binder of what whole food is, right, as your book um, and, and life that we are all one whole unit and we choose those Places to come together and and uh, and do it wholly and do it well and do it authentically. Um, I love your recipes in the back of your book. Where did you write them? Did you? Is that just uh, something that you your sister? You know, when you guys were growing up, is is that is that from family stuff or? <clears throat> Well, I have to tell you, inter the recipes was interesting because it had to follow the WISE, mm. and originally. Oh my God, Aaron. Yeah, I will. Uh, anyway, W-I-S-E. And I'm like, oh, uh, like I have a salmon pate, like Lisa mentioned, uh, the website ggbrardi.com. That's to sign up to get recipes and, uh, and also for book giveaways. But anyway, thank you, North Atlantic Books. But anyway, um, and one of the recipes, if you sign up, is the salmon pate. And I just couldn't wrap my head around the gelatin. And we uh, tried with agar agar and, you know, is that a whole food gelatin? Well, I don't know if you kill your, most people are not into that. You know, they yeah, don't have man. like the backyard livestock, except for my, my um, roommate in college. So Aaron asks about the goat. No kidding. So my roommate in college, one of them was Italian, but she really was Italian. Like her parents, my grandparents were born in Italy. Her parents came from Verbigaro, this little town in southern Italy. Super legit. And so in in uh, on, on Union Street, right? Did I say Union Street? On Union Street in San Francisco, like not in the hinterlands, um, they had uh, you know, uh, building a house, kind of house that, and, uh, and the roof, they had a goat. I know, I don't know. This is not going to be a good story for vegetarians, but like they had a full on goat at the, uh, so the point is if, if one is into that, 
where there is a will, there's, there's always a way. way. Yeah. That's right. To hang on to your family traditions yeah. and your cultural building and maintaining page one. Yeah, I know. Uh, your cultural <laughs> identity, your cultural identity, much less pocketbook. It was pretty inexpensive meat if one was going to eat meat. Yeah. That's a great Personally, question. I love it. I love uh -huh. that. That's but crazy. there's 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 more. She also fried, yeah, Erin. She also fried vegetables in an electric in an electric uh, skillet. If anyone remembers those, and it, the oil would spatter all over. I'm not saying this is an Italian thing necessarily, but anyway, <laughs> it would spatter all over the walls and my other roommates. Yeah, Claire, I know. It's a mess. My other roommates didn't think that was really funny. They weren't <laughs> No. And your mom and your mom didn't use the, the what was that little strainer thing that you throw at the top and this little fry thing <laughs> I know. from splattering, you know, the that thing that went over it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was a mess. Okay, so you don't need to be well, I don't know. Probably not just Italian, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what drove you to, to write food wise? What was the, was there, what, what propelled you? You know what? Um, it, uh, this kind of gets into writing, a writing and publishing question. And I bet I'm going to have the opportunity to talk about this a little bit more if I have a chance to, um, to uh, address the right, uh, welcome writers and publishers. But um, uh, I had a sabbatic in 2012 and 2013. And, um, oops, boom, let me undress for you. Uh, 2012 and 2013. And to write a book about food that was going to be a part memoir, it was going to be memoir and recipes, basically. And, um, that I really struggled with that book and I pitched it to a lot of agents and people said, oh, the writing's okay. Um, but like, it's just not like so interesting, universal ideas here. The other thing was that other book was based heavily in and on food psychology. So the psychology of eating. So mm -hmm. if you have if you have a red plate, but with a white rim, are people going to eat more food or less food? Or in a school cafeteria, if you put this here, but then, you know, anyway. So, yeah. and, and that work was actually recanted. It was, it was very, all academic work. I had even gone to Cornell University. I won't mention you can just email me privately who the <laughs> academics were who were involved. And so I kind of went off that, uh, went off that. And then I, in one of my global learning programs, so I'm very lucky. I teach eco gastronomy courses in Switzerland and in Florence in Italy and in Mexico. So in 2007, oh, wow. in 2017, I did these eco gastronomy uh, these eco gastronomy courses with Dan Nestle and uh, Holly Nestle, and um, and uh, and uh, I was coming back, uh, and uh, that year I'd actually done in the academic year two of them. Uh, I was coming back from Mexico, and the person that I was kind of co-teaching with said, I have a publisher friend and they're looking for a food book. Mm. That was in 2017. So I resuscitated the book and, 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 and originally it wasn't just memoir. That food psychology piece was addressing fierce food beliefs, fierce mm -hmm. food beliefs we have about food. And anyway, I pitched the first two chapters and they were like, yeah, we're, we're good. But can you rewrite this second chapter on, on agriculture? Well, it took me all academic year to have time to finish the second chapter. So in 2018, in June, in Italy, I finished the second chapter, sent it to them. I got the book contract in August of 2018, and I was on my way to Switzerland for another sabbatic in wow. September. And so I put the book together in July. And in August, left in September, finished 
finished uh, a draft in February of 2019 and sent it in. And the draft I sent in was just a draft. And they must have read a paragraph in the first chapter that was reasonably well written and said, okay, we'll just put this in galleys. And that's what they did. <laughs> they put a draft of the book, which was not ready to be set into galleys in galleys. So I spent the next six months editing from gal a PDF, meaning oh, every single edit, maybe 1500 edits, had to be written out had to be written out like every period the old sentence written out period added new sentence written in I, I, it was ridiculous anyway and so i really didn't finish that until the end of september of 2019 and the book was was out in january of 20. wow kudos to you Kudos to you. It takes so much work to uh, to to put down to pen and to many times of correction of to get your point across and um, and all that you've learned and all that you teach and all that you travel and and become more informed and that you inform the your students and the people you since the book has come out have you evolved have you seen change from the effects of writing the book and your awareness to what's in front of you now. Mm. So, yes. <laughs> and <laughs> let me just say, it sounds like I'm a walking advertisement, but um, Darren Brown um, from Trinidad, Tobago, who is uh, who has an administrative position. He's a videographer uh, at Western. He is doing a film on the book, which will be out sometime next year. But but the. And the theme of that has been, what have I learned? You know, what, especially in COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, one of the things I've done is just experience people talking and crying and screaming, but mostly talking and writing uh, about um, issues around, issues around um, getting good food. Uh, mm -hmm. especially now in, in COVID uh, on a consistent basis. And, you know, one of my themes in the book is, is pretty much, we just need to be talking to each other. We just yeah. need to be talking to each other and anything that is polarizing, I'm not signing up for. I mean, I do have a bottom, a bottom line so in terms of my evolution it's how difficult it is to get to the the table i do have a mm -hmm. bottom line like i'm not going to start talking about torture and perspective or something you know and you know uh <clears throat> slave trades no but uh <laughs> but um but we have a, a lot of book. <laughs> we have a lot of we have a lot of challenges in this county. I'm in Whatcom County. Not everyone is in Whatcom County, nor on the West Coast. Hi, Deb. Uh, but um, uh, and uh, there are uh, there's a lot of polarizing uh, forces uh, in the county, and I just I I can't abide by it that doesn't mean i'm not outspoken i am mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but i can't abide by it because look what happened in not this election but the previous election and i, I think a piece of that is not talking to each other and right. um and and so uh just it's 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 a challenge um so I, and I'm, I, I don't know. The other thing is I'm just constantly struck by just doing a little piece, you know, as I don't know, I have like one little thing here from the book, I think. Uh, yeah. So this is like what I say. So with food wise, you've learned some guidelines. Um, and I hope you can follow them. I believe it is possible to live a food-wise life, at least try, because that is where we need to be. 
if everyone is trying much of the time, then we're going to get there. Right. And, you know, before that, um, before that, um, I, I ask, I ask in the book, um, I talk about good enough, but there's also good enough 30% food wise over a whole day, a whole month. What about just sometimes mm -hmm. evolve cafe once a month, once a week, what, whatever, or just when we're eating at home or just when we get paid, <laughs> are there some situations where it makes sense to choose sane over sustainable when we're eating out with friends? Well, yes. And the example I think of is the takeaway lesson from the women's self-defense class I once completed, just run. So in mm -hmm. the six week long course, I learned lots of moves. At the end, I asked, if someone is coming at me, which move do I use? How do I decide? Which one's the most effective? I've been in here for six weeks. And the instructor's response to me was, you know, you just run. You run. That's the first thing you do. It kind of, it's an yeah. instinctive thing. It's like uh, once I took a fear of flying class just to do it with uh, US Air and, or something and uh anyway it was at, LA, at tracon we were in tracon in lax and uh the the last night was we're on an airplane and we're on the runway and we're on the runway and it and it's taking off and it, you know they're like you know vo2 max blah 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 and then they abort and i'm like okay what happens if there's a fire and anyway I, my point is this that um, that, you know, you always have to just keep asking these hard questions, but it, it might be just the obvious and then everything else is part of a process. I, I notice here a really good question. Yes, it's a great question. Did you see that? The one area yeah. of research that went into this book that you wish you had had more time to study or what topic would you like to revisit in future writings? Lamai, it is ex it is exactly what I was talking about when Christy asked me about the evolution, and that is the community of farmers, uh, community of farmers in Whatcom County, and community of farm workers and farm worker uh, advocates, and I'm super I'm super interested. I'm super interested in in the competing and conflicting narratives there and working with people to with students with students in particular and my colleagues in nonprofit organizations to uh, to, to to look at the research that we need to do and how thorough the research needs to be um, uh, before we can contribute productively to those narratives. And it's part of getting everyone to the table when everything leading up to that one moment has been so divisive and trying to um, offer guidelines. Mm -hmm. Great question. So what's next for Whatcom County? Are you gonna are you gonna come and are you gonna touch in with restaurants? Are you are you gonna come see us professionally and yeah. um, talk about food wise with us professionally? Well, share those in, um, those yes. insights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Washington State is um, Washington State is so particular. It's so interesting. It is a very uh, special and exciting state to be living in for a variety of reasons. And um, one of them has to do with the, one of them has to do with foodies, uh, the relative <laughs> percentage of foodies, if I can, if I may, um, in Whatcom County and in and in the state. And so uh, at least 7% of sales of food is direct sales. So that would be uh, markets, farmers markets, directly marketed food, um, CSAs, 
And um, that's really exciting. It means that the oh. ground is fertile here for, um, for uh, farm to table. So farms are important and tables are important. And, um, and, and of course, I would like to offer, um, offer and learn and listen um, these food wise guide guidelines uh, yes in in restaurants and I would like us supporting um, supporting the work of making those connections the restaurants are doing a farm a farm to table and cafeterias mm -hmm. and hospitals and uh, and and other institutions and uh, it's really important. And uh, I just saw, oh, I saw, I was on some group and I'm trying to uh, be a contributing member of as many groups in Whatcom County as, as I can that said that they had just gotten their Christmas, so-called Christmas uh, meal from Evolve Cafe, uh, chocolate and cafe, you better get yours before uh, you yeah. run out of meals. And, and I just think that it's really all about leveraging, especially for, I think about my students, definitely on tight budgets. And uh, it's, it, it's all about leveraging. Frequently I get the question, well, like, you know, I'm a busy, uh, you know, uh, working father. I've got two kids, you know, what can I cook for my kids tonight? And I think what I love to do is like get the entree uh, out of all, and then I make my own rice and beans. I make right. my own like, you know, take the turkey carcass and uh, simmer it in the rice, do these crazy, I mean, I just like experiment, but I don't, uh, you know, it helps me that I, you know, that I am making some choices about working and then I can, get my entrees here. I can get my salads at the co-op and support the co-op. Not everyone needs to do that, but I'm certainly in the position where, uh, where I want to. I think so um, many people can support so much. You can support uh, financially. You may not feel that buying directly from farmers or, or being able to maybe come to us or other places, but you can pick and choose. And that's a great option to be able to say, I'm going to go do this one thing, but I'm going to make a salad at home. I'm going to do this and combine them. And then you have the whole picture, literally the whole picture together. I think mm -hmm. it's awesome. It's a great, great way for people. Yeah. I mean, and in that idea of just a little bit or just like, <laughs> you know, what's the essence sustainable? What am I going to do? You know, less trips to the supermarket, you know, right. walk. I don't know. Little things like bring your own bag, except not right now. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, that, you know, just like even in the book, I say opening up a can of soup and adding pepper adding yep. some spice to it probably not salt but anyway uh pepper is cooking in my book do you want it do you want to cook like that all the time and I, no but if you do cook like that a lot then i can uh spend my precious pennies on uh free ranch eggs or a free range chicken that's right and then you room to experiment and experiment yes gives you a moment of confidence, right? Experimentation is about confidence and food is about confidence. Yeah. And uh, being comfortable where you're, where you're coming from. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Uh, it's definitely a life lesson food wise, for sure. Yeah. You know, someone, I got a, a call from a student and she was basically saying, um, how can I be like you? <laughs> and awesome. um, in terms of research with farmers and I was, um, uh, it was a little sobering because I, you know, I said, you know, farmers are super busy people. And so, and then and she pushed, it was great. She wouldn't back down. She was like, Hey, Gigi, you started somewhere. What, you know, <laughs> what, you know, for your masters, you know, with the Amish farmers, you know, what did you do? I wrote a letter. So, um, so I think just starting somewhere, uh, whether it's interviewing farmers for your own research, you know, you learn. And the next time, the next can of soup, you know, that's not going to work. The milk, you know, the pasteurized is not going to work. So buy the twin brook and just make less cheese. I don't know, except you'll make more because the yield will be greater because the fat content's higher, but whatever. So there's, there's no better. Time. 
the There's next no better time, instructor than yeah. the farmer or the rancher. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah. You'll learn. Yeah. yeah. I learned, um, you know, I was 17 when I started cooking and I, didn't, I went to a formal culinary school and worked for some pretty high end things. And <clears throat> it's life you learn through the years. But my connections with farmers and ranchers and my education ultimately came from what do I do with this? What do you do with this? What do you make at home to the farmer? What do you make with this particular potato? What does that look like for you or, or your cultural influences from, from their family? And that's, I gleaned information from them through the years of, of establishing, you know, my different questions and my, my knowledge that I needed. And it's, I highly suggest go to your farmer's market, you know, check in with, with your egg rancher, your chicken farmer and say, what do you do with these eggs? How do you poach them? Exactly, exactly. You, so uh, d part of the question, I think, was like a little bit, what's next? And um, right now I'm working on fiction. I'm fictionalizing a story of, uh, of, of a, a woman who was almost invisible uh, in the 16th century in mm -hmm. Renaissance Florence. And the story is she was, you know, a prince's mistress, then wife. They were both occultists, end of story. And it's not the end of story. So uh, I'm trying to talk about uh, about a, a powerful woman scientist trying to find her voice in the Renaissance. And, um, and it's super challenging. So I have uh, written 100,000 words, thrown that out. I keep writing and 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 working and and learning and learning a lot, but the next nonfiction book I want to write is on is on a women's collective in uh, Andhra Pradesh, India, mm. and one of those central states, and uh, it's a cooperative of about thirty thousand women. There are some men in it now, and they have started with nothing, with zero, with a penny wow. and they are now bankrolling amazing projects and it still is uh women controlled and the collective is called the timbuktu uh collective and um and i would like to write their story and uh but hopefully uh, the royalties from the book would go to the uh, would go to the collective. So this would be a much shorter uh, nonfiction work. And uh, I just haven't pitched it yet. Well, I, I, hopefully they're watching. <laughs> yeah. that's. I, I look forward to reading that. That'd be fantastic. Cheers to yeah. powerful women. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> um, need to be heard. Yes, I don't know if we have um, any other. I know we just have a few more minutes, and Lisa has been so nice to uh, post the website where people can get the um, get recipes. If we've got um, anything going on there, it's so funny because I, um, you know, I was looking at the book and um, really didn't want to read anything that, you know, I had read and other, <laughs> I've had a number of events. And uh, the th I just anyone who's read the book, uh, maybe uh, what I highlighted was I do love my very first image of the spider's web, but a lot of people don't like spiders. So I thought, mm, no, <laughs> it's nay on, on the spider story and being the, like the agricultural web. And then I had a story on sugar, like when I wrote another book, Finding Balance, which is a book about empowering dancers, dancers who suffer from perfectionism and how can they find balance. But I took a very strong stand that fat was bad, sugar was good. And in this book, it's just the opposite. So I, oops, I'm so sorry. So I talk about how I, how I learn um, and how it's really important not to be swayed, but to stick to whole, informed, sustainable experience and science-based, reputable science-based uh, uh, based information. And then I kind of looked at the attitudes, like what is food-wise? It's really an attitude, be a little feisty, be a little demanding, look out for your own welfare. Um, 
I also had something in here about bread uh, and um, and uh, like what is bread? And this is, I just take from from Stephen from Stephen Jones, and he's like bread. Uh, so uh, edible yeast plus edible whole grain flour make whole food bread. That's all you need. But processed flour plus BHT plus caramel coloring plus hydrogenated vegetable oil plus vital wheat gluten plus unspecified enzymes do not. So that's an example of, of whole. And then um, souffle, I, I say, cooking food wise isn't whipping up a perfect souffle, although you might think so if you look at my Instagram account, thank you, Holly, or staging <laughs> Instagram worthy plates. It's learning to put together some tasty whole food dishes, even with just a few simple ingredients. Um, and um, then I had one other comment here. My students sometimes wonder where I stand on food. They wonder if I am a low-fat devotee or a vegetarian or a raw foods missionary. Really, I am a proponent of one thing, mindful eating of mostly whole foods. I like to know where my food comes from. I like to think about the field or farm or farmer or fisher when I'm eating the food. I feel better knowing about those places and people. I believe that a main goal in life is to not be too hungry, but also to not overeat. In a house of teens, there was always that temptation with so much food around. I am selective about my sweets, but I'm especially fond of raw chocolates, velvety <laughs> texture, thank you, evolved chocolate. I believe unprocessed food is a good food choice. I believe in slow food, food that is good tasting, clean and efficient in terms of few waste produced and fair to all two-legged and four-legged beans, as well as those with fins. I didn't coin the good, clean, fair mantra. Slow Food Nation author Carlo Petrini did. I build on his ideas. Thank you for, for writing a book that is synonymous with what we do, what I do in my career, and what I have strived to, to become better at and more able to explain the type of food that I prepare, which is intentional uh, as much as possibly from local farmers and the things that are within our own region. And thank you for um, making that uh, that voice be heard. And it's uh, done very, very well. Very sweet and kind. Thank you. But also, this is not to underestimate the challenges in doing this, you mm -hmm. know, the challenges. Sure. The, the challenges, we've talked a teeny bit about it in the restaurant business and especially now with COVID. But I've got to say, <laughs> I've got to say, COVID is the great revealer, not equalizer. It is the great revealer yeah. and we are learning a lot. But our sources of information are sort in terms of what we can and can't do and what we have access to are are, are vitally, critically important. So it's interesting how the WISE, this acronym, mm -hmm. um, it, it works for almost everything because it's whole. I'm looking at the information source. Are people hunkering down to their ding-dongs and Twinkies? And really, it's all about comfort food, really? And so whole food Maybe. restaurants, fresh food restaurants can just kiss it goodbye. Are people really not patronizing restaurants? Because I should say also that I have um, I have a vlog series. And if you just go to YouTube, actually, you'll find it. You'll find it if you go to ggbarotti.com. So I've made a vlog for every night in lockdown. I'm now wow. over 200, 260 vlogs. One night I forgot, which thank you, sis, Cindy. She pointed out to me, my sister. But anyway, um, I did, and but I made two the next day, so don't worry. So it's one <laughs> every night in lockdown, being the perfectionist that I am, as you can tell from my hair. And uh, <laughs> and um, I am. So what I did in those vlogs was I read a paragraph 
from the book each night. So if you can't afford the book, you can listen to the 260 vlogs. And I'm still working on it. And I'm almost done, though. I'm, I'm almost to the recipes. I may be do, doing something different. Sorry, Cindy. I might be doing something different when I get to the recipes. But anyway, what I do is I take a top news story from the day that oftentimes my partner has uh, worked on with me, for me. And, uh, and oh, my gosh, the information on food since March 26th or March 25th in terms of what people are eating is mind boggling confusing. So whole, informed, sustainable experience. What is your experience? Information is secondhand experience. And for mm -hmm. many of us, that's all we have now. We've got to be critical. Yes, we not do. believe everything we hear in terms of what people want to eat, what they don't, what they can, what they can't. I don't know about you. I'm not one to be told what to do. So I, I, I certainly like to find my information and, and make sure that we're looking at all those choices that are out there for us that are of, of sound mind. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Well, I've just been sitting back enjoying this. This has been great. Um, I could, I could listen to the two of you go back and forth just all night long. I won't ask you to do that. <laughs> That'd be a long night for everybody. But um, thank you both so much. Yeah, um, thank you for having for, me. For being here tonight. Um, this was great. And thank you to the audience uh, oh, yes. for, for tuning in. And thank you for remember, the great questions. Remember to buy Gigi's book, the Village Books. <laughs> buy it. And oh, while I you're there, go to I then. Sure oh, look at that. But with all my. Yes. <laughs> nice and don't forget if you want to be the favorite relative friend <laughs> whatever get a copy of Gigi's book with a gift card to evolve and it's like perfect so anyway that's just my suggestion so um <laughs> any uh any final words ladies uh, you rock that's what I have to say you rock no, I was just checked the question. The question was about the goat, the goat on the rooftop. Yep, mm -hmm. I put that in the chat because I was afraid it wasn't going to be seen in the uh, lovely. In the, uh... All right, well, Claire, I thank think you, Christy, that's thank it. you, thank, thank you, you so audience. Much. Yes, thank you, everybody. This was wonderful. Happy holidays, everybody. Stay safe and uh, and uh, well fed, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Au revoir.